So good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really happy to try and contribute to this course. And as Andres already introduced, um, I lead this group that is called Cellular Immunology. And so we mostly use animals for our studies. But what I would like to do today, what I've tried to do in my presentation, is to give you, before I go and tell you about our own experiments, a brief overview of, I mean, it's, it's huge and it's very vast, so I will not be able to cover all uh, the possible approaches and studies, but just I selected a couple of, of concepts that might be interesting for you to know about uh, how mouse models have been instrumental in defining immunological principles. Uh, I wonder, are many of you uh, have a strong background in immunology or some of you? Okay, so there's no problem in going quite uh, basic in it. And, um, and then I will tell you about what we've been doing over the years uh, in two different contexts. We've been studying uh, an immunodeficiency using a mouse model of the disease. And it's been, it has been an interesting uh, experience because we could really find some phenotypes in the animals and then connect to the clinics and kind of validate what we had discovered in the animals and, 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 and we could see that it was also true uh, in, in the patients. And then at the end, I will tell you instead about a more recent area of research in our lab that has to do with the uh, suppression of a specific immune cell subset in the tumor microenvironment. So I'd like to start with this uh, overview of uh, uh, how mouse models developed over the years. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these names. And, and I'm also sure that most of you can agree that immunology is one of the field uh, for which the, the use of mouse model has been really um, uh, exploited a lot. In, uh, already in 1962, there has been the first uh, report of an immune deficient mouse model because of a spontaneous mutation that has no thymus and lack T cells. So obviously the interest of these models was, and, and, and the, the search for, for these models were, were to have um, a system where immune, human, human immune cells could be grafted to study their development and their function. So these mice tolerate a little bit of engraftment of human immune cells. But then a second mouse model, the, was discovered again due to spontaneous mutation. In this case, these mice are more immune deficient as they lack T cells and B cells. And therefore, they uh, can uh, allow a better engraftment of human hematopoietic stem cells. There has been then a lot of, of further uh, improvement. For instance, in 1995, by crossing skid mice to non obese diabetic mice that are. Uh, I will tell you, the people reached uh, a cross that was even more immune deficient, that lacks B cells, B cells, no complement, and no NK cells. And this was, again, uh, a way to allow human hematopoietic uh, cells to be tolerated and to develop, in part, in this mouse recipient. Again, the engraftment was not ideal, was not optimal, so people kept on searching for better and better model, and this led to the discovery that crossing not skid mice to mice that are deficient in the IL-2 receptor gamma, which is a receptor that is shared by many cytokine receptors, this gives rise to what is now called NSG mice, and these animals are really good in tolerating engraftment of, of human cells. This is still something that keeps on developing because the reconstitution is still partial in a way, so you get not all immune cell subsets can reconstitute, not all grow at their optimal level, and there are still many gaps, for instance, in the selection of uh, uh, the endogenous repertoire because we still can't reconstitute a thymus that support the process of immune selection, but improvements are being made. And what this has led to is the possibility to study, for instance, tumor immunology in a almost fully humanized animals, so in which you can 
implant a xenograft coming from, from a tumor and at the same time analyze the crosstalk with the immune system because your immune system will be of human uh, origin. And this is actually better shown in this cartoon. So we have already seen what are NSG mice and how they have been uh, developed over the years. So now these mice allow to be injected with hematopoietic stem cells. CD34 is the marker of the cells that have the highest uh, pluripotent potential, so they can give rise to almost all the images. When these cells are injected in the NSG mouse, you can get what is called the humanized uh, animal. And in here, it's listed what are the subsets that you can reconstitute of human origin, so metacardiocytes, platelets, monocytes, granulocytes, BEP, and NK cells, and you can reconstitute somehow also mucosal immune uh, function. And these can be used, as I mentioned before, to implant a xenograft, so a tumor coming directly from the patient, and then study the growth and the interplay with the immune system. And especially these tools are extremely useful for preclinical drug testing. So not only to test drugs that act directly on tumor cells, but also to test antibodies that somehow influence the activity of the immune system. And I'm sure you're all aware about checkpoint inhibitors and all the drugs that act by potentiating the immune system against tumors. So all these developments that, again, are still in progress have as a goal the possibility to test immune stimulatory drug in a context that is as possible as close to the situation in, uh, in the clinic. And this is again summarized. Yeah, so if you ask for in the previous one, I don't know, maybe I, I don't know, but you know, and I'm explaining this. But is you, you never have uh, in, in, when you transplant CD34 cells into an immunosuppressed mice gas versus host reaction? This is minimal. This is really a simplified cartoon, but there has been okay, but you, you can have Yeah, but all this has been reduced to the minimum to avoid the... Because you don't have the mouse immune system anymore. Yeah. So this is, this is the type of input. So on one hand, over the years, these models have been optimized to reduce the host versus graft disease, and at the same time to favor development of all no, lineages the, from the The contrary, the graft versus host. If you have reaction to yeah. the mouse system, yeah. you often have uh, deletion in the image C class 2 and 1 in order to oh. avoid that. So, yeah, okay, so I think it goes okay. Again. okay, so um, so I told you about development of these uh, recipient animals that could somehow recapitulate the immune cell tumor cell interactions in a situation that resembles what's going on in humans. Of course, it's not perfect. But it's just to mention the fact that this is an area of active and intense research, try to, to develop and push this sort of systems uh, further. Uh, now I'm going to switch and instead tell you something about uh, studies in mouse models, like just mouse models without any human self in it, but how use of knock-in and knock-out and mouse models has been instrumental in defining some of the paradigm of the immune cell cancer cells crosstalk. And for instance, this is uh, what uh, the experiment, and I, I, I'm going to show you experiments that allow to uh, define this important concept, that it's called the elimination, equilibrium, and escape paradigm. So we now know I mean, that nascent lesions are recognized and kept under control by our immune system that can eliminate initial uh, tumor cells when they just start to grow because they are recognized as foreigners. There's then a second phase that is called the equilibrium whereby <coughs> tumor cells are still there, they don't get eliminated, but they are kept under control by the immune system and something happens during this phase which is called tumor editing but I will go back to this in a second. And there's a, then a transition when tumor can escape immune control and grow because they have acquired the capability not to be recognized by the immune system. And this is normally what is observed in the clinic, of course. So mouse models have been very important to define these steps before 
he outgrows. And uh, as I mentioned, this has been, uh, there are of course uh, data from the clinics that tells that immune compromised individuals develop more tumors. But in order to define exactly uh, and formally prove that this is the case and what are the cell types and axes and pathways involved, mouse models have been really important. And the studies that dates back to the beginning of 2000 show that if you induce, if you have tumors in an animal that, are, that can come from different um, type of approaches, they can be carcinogen induced tumors, spontaneous tumors in aging animals or genetic models of cancer. If you cross these models to animals that lack defined immune cell subsets or pathways, then you get more tumor. And I'm going to show you just one of these examples. Uh, it, it's been some of milestone papers from the group of Robert Schreiber in the States. So in this case, what I'm showing you here, the, the experiment was as follows. Animals uh, were induced with a carcinogen to develop sarcomas, and then they were monitored for tumor development. And as you see here, this is the growth in an immunocompetent wild-type animal. If you do the same type of induction in a rat to deficient mouse, which is a mouse that lack B cells and T cells, the number of tumors and the time in which tumors develop is significantly accelerated and higher. And this went on then and by crossing on several other knockout, knockout background like the interferon gamma knockout, interferon gamma or interferon gamma receptor knockout animals which lack the receptor for interferon gamma. There is a key cytokines for the action of these CDA T cells and NK cells, or STAT1, which is an important adapter for the signaling cascade downstream of interferon gamma, or another kinase involved in the signaling cascade. Again, you get more tumor. So every time you interfere, with the capacity of our immune system to act during this phase of immune surveillance, you get an higher incidence of, uh, of tumors. And this went on, I mean, then, then for the next 10 years, people knocked out almost every possible pathway to demonstrate each, the role of each of these axes to uh, immune surveillance. Uh, a second interesting experiment and an interesting concept instead uh, refers to this second phase, the phase of tumor editing. So we now know that not only the tumor can destroy and protect from nascent lesions, but also that it exerts a selection on tumor cells by sculpting the tumor and selecting over time, I mean, and the tumor fight back, and over time, more aggressive variants arise that can escape immune recognition, as I mentioned, and what is the experiment that led this concept is, is shown in here. So it's the same carcinogen-induced model of sarcoma. So if you, grow, if you induce the tumor to grow in an immune-competent animal, and then you take these tumor cells and you implant them in a syngenic animal, the tumor grow. However, if the induction is done in an immunodeficient background, the tumor grow, but when you, ha when you explant it and transplant it back to an immune competent recipient, then the tumor will be rejected. So this is really elegant, it's an old experiment, but I like it and I always show it to students because it really shows that the immune sculpting phase did not occur, so the tumor, the immune aggressive variants have not arised, therefore an immune competent host can reject uh, the tumor. Um, I'm gonna now, I'm gonna jump a little bit, and if any of you is interested in, in, in some of these aspects, I of course we can talk later and I can pass you reviews and, uh, and more um, information about uh, the groups that are the one that made the most important contribution in this field. Because I wanna just mention another very key uh, approach Immunologists are lucky in a, in a way because it's relatively easy to reconstitute the mouse with the genotype you want just transplanting bone marrow. And this is 
called, this is what, what is called Vormero chimeras. So you can irradiate your recipient so that you ablate all the immune system of the recipient mouse and you can then choose a donor mouse of your choice, inject the burn marrow in the tail vein. This experiment is really simple. As long as you have an irradiator, you can generate any genotype you want and you get your chimeric mouse. That's, that means that all the hematopoietic system will come from the donor. So imagine you want to have a knockout for a receptor, you just take the bone marrow and you generate your mouse. Of course, this is not like having a colony. You just generate your 10, 20 mice, you make your experiment and then, and then it's over. But it's really useful and you can do many other things. Imagine just that, for instance, the uh, before gene therapy, the, this is the system it's used to measure the selective advantage of a subset versus another by, for instance, mixing what is called bone, mixed bone marrow chimera. You take bone marrow from one animal that is deficient in a given receptor, receptor A, and then you mix it to uh, the bone marrow that is deficient, for instance, for receptor B. You put them together in your recipient mouse, and then you go and measure which one of the two is mostly represented in your final population. So you can really understand what pathway gives you a selective advantage for development of your hematopoietic system. And this is just one example of, of one experiment, it's just taken from a paper, that the, but there are really thousands, where you use congenic markers, so in, you can use bone marrow that have markers that you can track in vivo, simply by fax analysis. This is an example of CDC for CD45.1 mixed to CD45.2. In a recipient that this is CD45 1 and 2, and by fax you can then distinguish in your recipient animals the cells that comes from the point 1 or the point 2, and this is really easy to be done by fax. And in this specific case, the point 2 has also a deletion in rel B and C rel. It was a, a story where they wanted to, to address the function of these um, factors implicated in NFKB signaling. And so when you then have your reconstituted mouse, you go and analyze by fax and you see how many of your cells are coming from the donor uh, A or the donor A or the donor B. And therefore, as I mentioned, you can really assess what is the, the, the bone marrow that has the most important selective uh, advantage. And uh, uh, this is a third uh, and last example uh, of approaches that you can use that I'm going to give you before I'll go on with, with our own data. So this is um, actually a, a cartoon that shows development of myeloid cells. I have chosen to tell you about myeloid cells because it's what we study in the lab, but this can be shown for all the hematopoietic lineages. So from the multipotent precursors, you get, you give rise to several type of um, imprinted intermediate cells that can be, give rise to the final population you find in the blood and in the tissue by selected stages of development. There's still, nowadays, a lot of uncertainty about these pathways. So for instance, regarding the Lydic cells, that is the sub that immune cell subset that we study in the lab, it's still not absolutely clear at which step the cells become committed to be a dendritic cell. And this is true for also for some of the monocytes and some of the macrophages. So to answer to these sort of questions, people have uh, developed the state mapping approaches, which is not unique to the immune system, it exists for many other systems. But again, in the case of immunology, immunological studies, you have the advantage that you can do it just by transplanting bone marrow and creating chimeras. So the examples, for instance, that I'm giving you here, if you take cells from, again, we have the same markers, 45.2 or 45.2, a 45.2 donor that you implant in a recipient that is 45.1, and then you go and check at the uh, frequency of your engraftment and you exactly measure how many of your donor cells constitute your final population. And this is 
more interesting. You can, for instance, have a promoter specific for a given immune cell sub subset that drives expression of a fluorescent marker. You irradiate your animal, you implant back your bone marrow coming from the reporter strain, and you get in your final population in the blood and in the tissues a mixture of uh, fluorescent expressing versus non-fluorescent expressing cells, and you can address many questions depending on how your starting point here is uh, designed. Similarly, you can transfer in this phase after irradiation and transplantation. For instance, you can have populations of cells that express diphtheria toxin. I don't know if you ever heard about this system. It's a system to deplete in vivo. So you associate the specific promoter of your interest, let's say a, sp a promoter specific for B cells, driving expression of diphtheria toxin. You reconstitute your mouse with B cells that express diphtheria toxin. So all your B cells after reconstitution will have diphtheria toxin. <coughs> then with diphtheria toxin injection, you can kill and delete all B cells <coughs> at a given time point. So this is a great system again that offers many then opportunities to play with kinetics because with a simple injection in a couple of days, you get rid of all your B cell population. And again, these models exist even as stable uh, transgenic animals, but the trick of having the chimera allows you to address this in a much faster uh, way and gives you many opportunities to, to play with, with your design, with your experimental design. Yes, in this part, for how long you can keep the cells uh, in culture to perform the modification. You mean before you, you transferring? Mean you, you, yeah. you get the cells from the animal, the, yes. per, the donor animal. Yes. Then you want to modify, so you have to insert with the lentivirus, yeah. the, yeah, your uh, transgene, the, the Victoria toxic receptor, and then you amplify this, or, or just you direct transfect, or uh, um, do the. I want to just speak uh, uh, your question. No, 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 I got your point, obviously. So most of these approaches are done taking cells from a mouse that already express okay. your reporter or your gene of interest, and you go straight, you irradiate, and the day after you transfer. So you don't maintain the No, no, but you do it because all the, all the preclinical gene therapy approaches where you insert yeah. your gene back, you keep it. I can't tell you for how long, okay. but uh, I but think it's in the order of a week or something, so you transfuse, and then you repurify. But in the case of the diphtheria toxin receptor, you have a transgenic animal that expresses this, and then you take your bone marrow from this animal. Exactly, yes, okay. yes. And then there, there, there are many variations. One of the reasons, yeah, it's a little bit more complex than that. This is oversimplified, okay. but it's, uh, yeah, this is the... You don't express it in the bone marrow before giving it back. They come from a diphtheria toxin expressing animal. Um, another opportunity, again, of these uh, bone marrow chimeras is the possibility to introduce barcoding into your initial population and then study the potential of your precursors to give rise to different populations. For instance, imagine that it is, it is shown by colors here. You can imagine it can be colors now with the confetti mice, but it can be barcodes. So you give an equal amount of precursors that can, be, can give rise to several immune cell populations, but actually you don't know whether this uh, red is gonna give B cells, T cells, and myeloid cells, let's say. And by this experiment, you introduce an equal numbers of each cell type, and then you go and check after two months when reconstitution is completed how many how, how the different precursors are represented and so if you look in here what is obvious is that green and blue can give rise to all immune cell subset this is not shown but you can imagine that this is b cells t cells and can say it's myeloid cells these two precursors could give rise to multiple subsets whereas this is monopotent it only gives rise to monocytes and this thing can give rise to two types of cell subsets. So you can interrogate and, and follow the fate, this is called fate mapping, of different precursors and how they are going to be represented in your final population. And, um, and this is instead 
a further refinement of this technique. Perhaps you already mentioned this, and best no, in general. Minimum yeah. Goal. I mm -hmm. mentioned the uh, yeah. nominates, but not in this. Uh, but in this context, in this context, it is so. Again, it it goes back to this sort of open questions that see, still exist in immunology. People are really trying hard to understand once you have a committed precursors, how much plasticity you have in it. Can it, can it differentiate in all lineages? And at which point does it acquire uh, specificity and can only give rise to, for instance, a plasma cytoid disease and not go back? And how did people uh, address these sort of questions? This is a very smart approach. So you have, and I think we can, yeah, this is, the, this is the design. So you have a reporter, this is what matters. You have a reporter fluorescent uh, marker, which is not active unless you cross it. These are mice, of course, you can you have to imagine two different animals. You have to cross it uh, to an animal that express Cree under a specific promoter. Once you have this cross, your reporter will only be on in the cells that express that specific promoter. But what is even more interesting is that these cells are going to be marked for all their life. So if they have passed through expression of that specific promoter, they will be marked even if the promoter is not active in that lineage anymore. So you can really uh, trace back and know whether this cell has passed through this stage or not. Because, of course, this is based on the fact that you know exactly what promoters are active at this stage. And yeah, I mean, it's difficult to be exhaustive because there are so many. So again, I want to give you a coverage of all these possibilities. And I'm really happy if you want to know more about some of this system to discuss with you later, because now I'm going to move to our own studies, which is less general, of course, but I try to make it as uh, general as possible for you to, again, to get what can be done, depending on your question, using uh, mouse. <coughs> So we've been interested for many years in studying and trying to understand the, 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 the cellular basis of uh, uh, an immune deficiency, which is called Wiscodaldric. And this, this disease is caused by a mutation in a gene that calls for an, for an actin regulatory protein. This protein is only expressed in cells of the immune system. When this protein is mutated, it gives rise to um, yeah, so it's, it's a protein that, that um, promotes polymerization of new F-actin filaments. It's uh, a general, it, it belongs to a family, but this was a hematopoietic wasp, is only expressed in hematopoietic cells, as I said, and, and mutations or lack of this protein, as you can easily imagine, uh, totally disrupts the function of the immune system because immune cells need to migrate, and this needs competent cytoskeleton needs to phagocytose, interact with other immune cells. So over the years, people have discovered several uh, defects that cells lacking expression of the risk of older syndrome protein experience. And these are defects in T lymphocytes, in migration and cell activation, in macrophages and dendritic cells, again, migration and abnormal activation, and granulocytes and platelets. The C cell migration is an hallmark of, of the sort of defects we have in this syndrome. And, um, and, and, and we were interested especially in understanding better the defects at the level of dendritic cells in this syndrome. And dendritic cells are an essential antigen presenting cell, professional antigen presenting cells. They are needed to internalize antigens and present it to T lymphocytes to initiate T cell responses. So um, we wanted to know whether cells coming from a mouse model of the disease, so we got the animals, we didn't generate them, we got them from the states. Cells coming from this mouse uh, model of the disease are able or not to properly migrate to lymph nodes when we inject them in subcutaneously. So this experiment that you see in here is relatively simple. So we got cells. We differentiated bone marrow. We got bone marrow from the animals. We can differentiate disease from bone marrow. 
They come either from the wild type or wasp knockout uh, background. We label them with a the fluorescent dye, we inject them subcutaneously, and one, two, or three days later, we go and harvest the lymph node and measure for how many fluorescent cells we do find in the lymph node. So cells are injected in the, in, in the food pot subcutaneously, we measure how many comes to the lymph node. And as you can see here, the number of migrating cells in the case of wasp deficient animals is strongly reduced. And, it's, and this is not corrected by increasing the input dose. And similar experiment, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to show you all the movies, but we could also track the movements of these cells during their interaction with, with T cells, and these show that cells lacking the expression of this protein are not able to form proper contact with T cells, both when we isolate them and record them ex vivo and when we record them in lymph nodes. And this is, um, yeah. Uh, led to the conclusion, but this is a relatively old study that, and this was not known at the time, that cells that are deficient in this protein, in wasp protein, are not able to home to the lymph node properly, and once they are in lymph nodes, they are not able to interact with, with these cells. This has been uh, really useful to exactly define the defect in these cells, because at the same time, our collaborators in, um, in Milano were developing the first gene therapy uh, protocol for the kids affected by this syndrome, and they needed to to, evo to have ways to evaluate reconstitution in dendritic cells upon gene therapy in a preclinical model. And um, sorry, I, I put the wrong slide. And based on our readouts, they could indeed test. So this is exactly the example you were asking me before. What they've done in this case, they gene corrected the bone marrow from wasp animals, reconstituted the mice, and then they have measured the function of dendritic cells according to the type of outcomes that we had established, and they could indeed prove that when you reconstitute and re-express wasp protein in these animals, you can rescue the um, migration of the C2 lymph nodes, and you can also rescue the capacity to activate these cells, which is shown in here and better shown when we plot the number of CDAT cells upon immunization with the lymphic cells. So in a wild type animal, you do prime T cells. In a wasp deficient animals, you don't prime that well. But in gene reconstituted animals, you rescue the capacity to, um, to improve, uh, to improve this, this, uh, capa the capacity to prime adaptive immune responses. Um, Perhaps I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, I'm going to switch uh, skip this part, but it's just to tell you that then we went on over the years and we uh, got interested in understanding another aspect of this disease, which is the contribution of an excessive innate response. In particular, in this disease, we discovered that type one interferon is produced in large amounts, more than, than it should, because there is a lack of, of control, there is a lack of checkpoint that controls the production of these cytokines that are involved in several autoimmune diseases. This wasn't really known for, for Wiscott, so based on these previous studies, we decided to take a look and, and, and examine whether excessive type 1 interferon could be um, a pathway that leads to excessive uh, responses in these animals. And this is just to show a different type of, uh, of experiments that we have uh, performed. So for instance, one important thing to do is to measure the amount of different cell subset by flow cytometry. And we discovered that by doing this and identifying exactly different subset of the dendritic cells, we discovered that a subset that is called plasmacito in disease is um, expanded abnormally in most deficient animals. And uh, so in this case, what, what I wanted to, to tell you is that we found that in this uh, mouse model of the disease, we identified excessive production of type 1 interferon. And we could then validate that this was the case also in patients. So once we got this data, we asked to our collaborators to, to take blood and, and we performed some uh, uh, gene expression analysis. And we discovered that indeed, also in the patients, so this is values in the patients over the healthy, matching healthy donors, there are 
there is an increased expression of in type 1 interferon genes and type 1 interferon dependent genes, which was not known uh, before, so we kind of identified a novel axes that may lead to pathology. <coughs> but what was important in this going back and forth in the mouse uh, human model is that then we went back to mouse to mice to really prove that this matters for the pathology. And so we crossed our model of knockout animals to animals that don't express the IFNAR receptor to generate double, what we call double knockout animals. And indeed, it was striking to see that one major sign of immune pathology that is an enlarged spleen was strongly decreased when we crossed to an interferon receptor knockout background. And this is shown both by spleen wave and, and cell counts. And also that looking at the T cell infiltrate in the colon, because these mice develop colitis, when we analyze double knockout animals, these autoimmune signs are uh, decreased. So, um, so basically, this, well, these are the conclusions. We don't need to, to, to go through all of them. But what, I, what is important for me to, to deliver is that uh, having a nice uh, mouse disease model sometimes can help you, on one hand, to identify novel mechanisms, but also can really lead to, to um, novel uh, therapeutic options, because you discover a pathway that was not, uh, that was not known before. And, and this study goes on because we also studied the, the, the uh, involvement of neutrophils in the citrum. This is perhaps uh, going to take too long. I will just probably take five more minutes. Do you think it's okay? Um, yeah, to tell you about what I have anticipated in the beginning about our studies uh, on the role of dendritic cells in the tumor microenvironment. So this is, a, again, a, a very vast and, uh, and complex area of research. There are many immune cells that infiltrate and um, re reside in the, in the tumor bed, and people are studying how each of these subsets play a role in promoting or contrasting tumor growth. In our case, we decided to focus on the role of antigen-presenting cells in this context. And I just need to briefly uh, mention the fact that there are two major subsets of this, these uh, antigen-presenting cells. One is called DC1, the other one is called DC2. And it's now known that many, that, that especially the type 1 DCs are very important for tumor rejection, but also that they can be, their activity can be compromised in the tumor microenvironment. And basically what we wanted to study is what happens and what are the mechanisms that leads to this uh, repression. So for that, we established uh, a, mo a model of lung cancer, which is a genetically driven model of a lung adenocarcinoma. It's driven by mutation in KRAS on a P53 mode background. And we implant the cells in the lung and then harvest tissues at different time points. We isolate, we identify first by flow cytometry this specific cell subset, which is really rare in the total immune infiltrate. We can isolate by cell sorting and study the gene expression of the specific cell subset. And this is an example of all the different subsets that one can identify, actually there are even more, by flow cytometry. So when you take a tissue, you can, by using several different markers, identify different populations in the lung of a control or a tumor-injected animal. And what I'm showing you here is an example of how you can identify alveolar macrophages, for instance, when you get on a population that's CD11C positive and CD11B negative. If you then uh, go on and you take R1 within R1, looking at the expression of B6G, you can identify neutrophils. As you see, they are expand a lot in the case of, of tumors, which is plotted in here. You can identify neutrophils by use of another specific marker, that is CDKF. You can identify monocytes looking at cells expressing B6C. 
and on the R2 uh, gate you can identify T cells, so CD4 and CD8 T cells, and again measure their frequency and evaluate how they vary in the tumor tissue. Um, we have uh, especially developed the gating strategy to identify the C1, which I introduced you in, in the beginning, and we, uh, the first thing we did was to measure how their numbers vary in a control lung or in a lung that is infiltrated by tumors. And especially the next important step has been to isolate them by cell sorting. So once you have, you are able to clearly identify and gate on your population and distinguish them from all the other cells, then you can isolate them and have them and analyze them as pure cells and not anymore in a mixture. And this is really important when you want to assess the function of a, of a specific subset. You can perform functional assays using these cells, or you can uh, analyze their uh, gene expression. And for instance, this is what we have done in these studies, and I'm gonna very quickly, uh, I'm gonna go quickly through, through the results. We identify a receptor that is called TIM4, that is important for, that has been described in macrophages as important for the uptake of apoptotic cells. So how do we then uh, validate that this receptor is indeed important in our model? And this we go, um, we go back to, to mouse studies. So this is an example of it's totally how we measure apoptosis in vivo, uptake of apoptotic cells in vivo. Because we know this receptor can be critical in, in controlling this process, so this is an example of the experiment that we developed to measure the uptake of apoptotic cells in the lung by our subset of interest. So we have um, labeled apoptotic cells, which in this case are palmocytes. They come from a donor animal. They are induced to apoptosis by a combination of drugs, and they are labeled with a fluorescent dye. These cells are injected intratracheally, and a few hours later, we harvest lung tissues and we measure the fluorescence that is associated to different subset of, of phagocytes. We focus only on phagocytes in this case because these are the only cells that can take up dying cells. So this is, for instance, alveolar macrophages. As you see, they uh, take up, we say a lot. This is not a lot, it's 7.16%, but you can imagine that very few cells reach the lungs, so we don't expect numbers much bigger than that. CDC2 don't take up, whereas CDC2, uh, CDC1 take up fluorescent cells, but this is uh, abolished when we pre-block TIM4 in the animals by injecting a blocking antibodies. So this is, for instance, a way by which you can combine blockade by injecting systemically blocking antibodies to a given receptor, and then you assess the function of interest, in this case, by, by this approach of injecting labeled cells. And, um, and this is just a different uh, approach, but it answers to, to a similar question. In this case, we wanted to see the uptake of tumor cells. So we generated tumor cells that express a fluorescent reporter. We inoculate fluorescent tumor cells in the animal. We block our receptor, then we harvest the tissue, and we check again, this time I'm only focusing on, on CDC1, which is the cells we are interested in, we check how many of our cells have acquired fluorescence. So the fluorescence comes from the tumor cell. Every time we see this signal, it means, so this is an animal where you have no tumor cells. So you see this is the shift in blue fluorescent protein. Instead, when you see this 14% means that these cells have taken up tumor cells. So this way you can really measure in vivo the engulfment of dying tumor cells by a population of phagocytes in the lung. And this is again the result that it was interesting for us when we pre-block by systemic injection of TIM4, we abolish this, uh, this uptake. And I'm uh, um, just going to show you one last experiment and then I will conclude. This is to go uh, a little bit further and analyze not only the capacity to take up, but also the capacity to induce an immune response to antigens that are encoded by these dying tumor cells. And again, this is something that you can use relatively easily do in, in animal models, you couldn't do otherwise. 
So this time we inject into animals apoptotic cells that express a specific antigen, and we also inject T lymphocytes that are labeled that are specific for this antigen. So this time what we measure is the proliferation of these T cells. This proliferation is measured by loss of the dye, so each cell cycle division corresponds to a shift in fluorescence, so every time these lymphocytes divide, they lose fluorescence. So this is what you quantify as proliferation. So when we inject apoptotic cells expressing an antigen in, into a control animal, we do see proliferation. When we block our receptor, we don't see it anymore. So with this type of experiment, we can not only assess the capacity to engulf, but also the capacity to uh, induce uh, um, a T cell response. And uh, well, I'll ju just jump to, to the conclusions. It's just a cartoon to see that this type of approach uh, was important for us to identify a receptor that it's critical to take up dying tumor cells and induce a T cell response against nascent lesions. So what I told you before, a mechanism of surveillance that it's important, new mechanism of surveillance that it's important to control tumor cells that is interrupted uh, during uh, tumor, tumor growth.